a 70s style murder spree. I'm Jason Horton. I'm Rebecca Lieb. And this is Ghost Town. He had eyes cold as steel. It's like he was looking right through you. He was a con artist, smooth talker. Could con you out of your wallet, your watch, your car. There was nothing that would make you think he was a killer. He wanted to be a famous mass murderer. He killed men, women, boys, girls. He didn't discriminate. If he decided to kill you, you didn't have it. Just about everywhere he went, he left a body. The Casanova killer. I fell in love with him for maybe an instant. I always want to do episodes on serial killers for the podcast, but it always feels like it's either such a task to take on and research and actually do well, or it feels short and repetitive, maybe not as exciting as you might like to listen to. But the serial killer we're going to talk about today, his story is almost made for a movie and horrible and a little Thelma and Louise-y, so much so that you can't believe it even happened. Today, we're going to discuss the three-month-long killing rampage of Paul John Knowles, commonly known as the Casanova Killer. Paul John Knowles was born in Orlando, Florida on April 17, 1946. When he was just eight years old, he started committing petty crimes that escalated so much that his father gave him up to live in foster homes and reformatories. When it came to crime, he really hit the ground running. At 19, Knowles went to jail for kidnapping a police officer, and in the years following, he went in and out of prison. In early 1974, Knowles was doing time at Rayford Prison in Florida, now Florida State Prison, where he began corresponding with a recently divorced cocktail waitress in San Francisco named Angela Kovic, who delighted to have Knowles as a pen pal, and after a few letters back and forth, had fallen in love with him. Now, here's one thing you should know about Paul John Knowles. He is, and this is hard for me to say, he's hot. He's very attractive. Not like Ted Bundy, clean cut, handsome Kennedy. He's a hot guy. And for the 70s especially, he was hot. He had been called a cross between Robert Redford and Ryan O'Neill, which again, to look like fucking Robert Redford in the mid-fucking 70s, yeah. In addition, Knowles was also super smooth, charming, a good talker, tall. It is a bad combination for a criminal. Some say that when Angela Kovic got to Rayford Prison to visit Knowles, he proposed to her on the spot. She accepted, and Kovic became instrumental in getting Knowles released from prison by paying for all of his legal counsel. Others say she saw him after he remotely proposed, and she flew him out to San Francisco so they could be together. This version goes that Kovic, upon seeing Knowles, decided not to do it. Things completely changed. According to her, Knowles projected a, quote, aura of fear. Along with this aura, her psychic had recently warned her about a dangerous new man in her life. Kovic completely cut ties, ended the relationship, and called off the wedding. Although this has never been verified, Noel says he murdered three people on the streets of San Francisco the night Kovic broke off their relationship. Devastated by the rejection, Knowles returned to Jacksonville, Florida. He was soon arrested after stabbing a bartender during a fight, but he picked a lock on his detention cell and escaped on July 26, 1974. And then his cross-country murder spree began. Knowles escaped from prison in Jacksonville, almost immediately breaking into the home of 65-year-old retired school teacher Alice Curtis, bound and gagged her, ransacked her home for money and valuables, and then stole her car. Curtis choked to death on her gag. While unconfirmed, many believe Knowles may have also kidnapped and killed two family acquaintances on August 1st, 11-year-old Lillian Anderson and 70-year-old Maylet Anderson. The two girls disappeared around the same time of Knowles' escape. 13-year-old Imogene Sanders, who had run away from her home in Beaumont, Texas in July to be with her mother, who lived in Warner Robins, Georgia, was likely also murdered on or after her disappearance on August 1st, 1974. On August 2nd, 1974, yes, this is all in the span of two days, Knowles met 49-year-old Marjorie Howie in Atlantic Beach, Florida. She either invited him or was forced by him to go into her apartment where he strangled her with a nylon stocking and stole her TV. On August 23, 1974, Knowles arrived in Musella, Georgia, and forced his way into the home of Kathy Sue Pierce, who was there with her three-year-old son. Knowles strangled Pierce but left her son unharmed. As August rolled into September, Knowles hit the Midwest. On September 3, 1974, he entered Scott's Inn, a roadside pub near Lima, Ohio, and met William Bates, a 32-year-old account executive for Ohio Power Company. 
The bartender who knew Bates recalled that Bates and a young redheaded man had several drinks that evening and left together. Bates's wife then reported him missing. Near the bar, police found an abandoned car that was subsequently traced back to Alice Curtis, you remember her as Noel's first victim, back in Florida. In October, Bates's nude body was found. He had been strangled and dumped in the woods. Now driving Bates's car, Knowles moved on to a campground in Eli, Nevada, where on September 18, 1974, he bound and shot two elderly campers, Emmett and Lois Johnson. Because it was seemingly a random murder, and of course Knowles at the time moved quickly across states, there was no immediate leads aside from Knowles using the couple's credit cards for a short period of time to pay his expenses. At September 21, 1974, Knowles hit Seguin, Texas. There he met stranded motorcyclist Charlyn Hicks, whom he abducted and raped before strangling her with her own pantyhose and dragged her body through a barbed wire fence. Her body was found four days later. He then made his way to Birmingham, Alabama, where on September 23, 1974, Knowles met beautician Ann Dawson. We're not sure whether he abducted her or if she traveled with him willingly, but she paid the bills while they traveled together for six days until he killed her on September 29, 1974. Knowles claims to have dumped her body in the Mississippi River, but it was never found. Knowles then arrived in Marlboro, Connecticut on October 16th, where he entered the home of Karen Wine and her 16-year-old daughter Dawn. He bound and raped them before killing them with a nylon stocking. The only thing found missing from their home was a tape recorder. On October 18th, Knowles made his way to Woodford, Virginia, where he broke into the home of 53-year-old Doris Hosey, shot her to death with her husband's rifle, then wiped his prints from the gun and placed it beside her body. Afterward, police would find no signs of robbery to offer them a motive in the case. Still driving William Bates's stolen car, Knowles picked up two hitchhikers in Key West, Florida, with the intention of killing them both. But just when he was about to kill them, a policeman stopped them for a traffic violation. Unaware of who he was dealing with, the officer let Knowles go with a warning. Shaken, Knowles dropped his intended victims off in Miami and contacted his lawyer shortly thereafter. His lawyer was like, Please surrender. But after a conversation I wish I could travel back in time and listen in on, Knowles and his lawyer decided to meet. The meeting lasted only long enough to hand over a taped confession, and after that, Knowles fled town before police were informed of his location. On November 6th, Knowles befriended Carswell Carr in Milledgeville, Georgia, and Carr invited Knowles to spend the night. Over drinks, Knowles stabbed Carr to death and then strangled his 15-year-old daughter. After murdering the 15-year-old daughter, I guess this is his... Part of his confession, Knowles attempted to have sex with a body. An investigator who worked the murders called it, quote, the bloodiest scene he'd ever seen. Knowles stabbed Carswell so many times that he broke the tips of the scissors off, which is what he used to stab him in the body. We can take that detail to the bank. Two days later, Knowles decided to go bar hopping in Atlanta, where he met British journalist Sandy Fox impressing her with his looks. Yes, she's the one who said Knowles looked like a cross between Robert Redford and Ryan O'Neill. And she called him a dreamboat, which probably sounds even more disgusting now that more about Knowles and what he was capable of. They spent the night together, but Knowles repeatedly couldn't get it up. This suggests, according to research, that sex was difficult for Knowles when his companion was willing and consenting. They spent two days together, drinking, having fun, being together. According to Fox, not once during their time together did he show any signs of wanting to hurt her, and she remembers her time with the serial murderer fondly. After they parted ways, Knowles picked up an acquaintance of Fox named Susan McKenzie and demanded sex from her at gunpoint. She escaped and notified police, but when patrolmen tried to stop him, Knowles threatened the patrolman with a sawed-off shotgun and escaped. Now we're at November 12th in West Palm Beach, Florida. Knowles broke into the home of Beverly Maybe, where he abducted her sister and stole their car. From there, he traveled to Fort Pierce, Florida, arriving the following night. He dropped off Beverly's sister, completely unharmed, on the roadside. On November 16th, Florida Highway Patrol Trooper Charles Eugene Campbell recognized Knowles' stolen car near Perry, Florida, and attempted to make an arrest. But after he was pulled over, Knowles wrestled the officer's pistols away from him. Taking Campbell hostage, he drove away in his patrol car, later using its siren to stop motorist James Meyer in order to ditch the highway patrol vehicle and continue in a less conspicuous vehicle. Now with two hostages, Knowles took Campbell and Meyer into a remote wooded area in Georgia and handcuffed them to a tree before shooting each one of them in the head at close range. After, Knowles crashed the car through a police roadblock. He escaped from the vehicle on foot and fired shots at the pursuing officers. Knowles was shot in the foot during his escape, but the police closed in using dogs and men on foot, cars and helicopters. They still couldn't catch him. 
Knowles was cornered on November 17th by a 27-year-old Vietnam War veteran and hospital maintenance worker named David Clark, an armed civilian with a shotgun who was just in the right place at the right time. Clark then escorted Knowles to a nearby house where a couple, Joe and Becky Stonecipher, made a phone call to the police. Knowles was outside of the perimeter established for the hunt and would have definitely escaped if the civilians hadn't been proactive about catching him. Once in custody, Knowles admitted to being responsible for 35 murders, but only 20 were ever corroborated. For most of the spree, the police were mystified by the murders, their patterns, and the violence that spanned six different states. On December 18, 1974, Sheriff Earl Lee and Agent Ronnie Angel from the Georgia Bureau of Investigation were traveling with Knowles, handcuffed in the back seat, on a tour of places he had committed to acts of violence. Today, they were going to where Knowles dumped Charles Campbell's handgun. The GBI reported, Knowles grabbed Lee's handgun, discharging it through the holster in the process, and while Lee was struggling with Knowles and attempting to keep control of the vehicle, Angel fired three shots into Knowles' chest, killing him instantly. Before he was killed by the police, though, Paul John Knowles recorded kill tapes. He wanted that, when he died, his crimes to be made known or published, and all the proceeds would go to his mother. But most of the tapes were lost after a mysterious flood in a courtroom, though there is some tape that still exists online, and it's I listen to it. It's it's very casual. It doesn't sound crazy or creepy or scary at all. It sounds like a normal man discussing normal things, which is obviously exactly what that wasn't. And that's the legacy of John Paul Knowles' horrifying yet cinematic three-month murder spree across the United States. It's easy for me to sit here and poke holes through why this went so wrong. It's easy mm-hmm. to do that. And I, I maybe attribute some things to him not looking like a serial killer. It's probably very disarming. This person doesn't look like it, whereas somebody who might look like it. Profiling, quotes, yeah. And y- you let that be the thing that dictates it, especially if the police are like, oh, this guy doesn't look like anyone who mm-hmm. would, he looks like a regular guy. He's got a normal haircut. Yeah. He doesn't look like a, a, a hippie or a burnout, and he's, if you're racially profiling, probably fits a thing that is, this person looks like somebody I should just trust implicitly. Uh, And I think that was to their demise. He got through police like it was nothing. And it seemed like even when, on his last day, they seemed pretty like trustworthy of this person to be able to get a hold of the police, the policeman's gun. Yeah. And it's a little bit on them i don't know i i just don't get i i feel like yes things happen in circumstances but if it was somebody else mm-hmm. he probably wouldn't have gotten as far yeah i mm-hmm. i agree in with theory that. In i think theory. so and just like the again just even the consistent violence mm-hmm. over and over and there's maps of where he went and and what happened in those places but i get it it's like Cross different jurisdictions whatever but like still like these things are happening literally day to day Follow the days and follow the violence that happens on each day in you know, driving distance or whatever. In a driving distance. I'm making assumptions, but hitchhiking was a thing mm-hmm. then. You learn don't hitchhike, but in 1974, 1973, mm-hmm. hitchhiking was – I don't know what the campaign was for not hitchhiking, but it probably started more after that. Yeah. And – People locking their doors, and that seemed like a thing like now, like home security is huge. But it's like for a time it was like, oh, no, we don't lock our doors. No. We don't lock our windows. We're in rural Georgia. We don't even have a lot of visitors. And that's not on the people to be like, we should have locked your door. But there is something to like, if somebody wants to get in somewhere, they're like, Mm -hmm. no, this is locked. Move on to the next one that is open. Totally. And I think for me, it's horrible. And yeah, we can talk all about negligence. For me, it was the parts where he didn't kill people or he had a two-day love affair with somebody. And it it felt like to me, it was this sociopath. I don't, I'm not like a doctor. I can't diagnose this person, but an insanely troubled, violent, dangerous person who was allowed based on how they look into people's lives in a way that was more easily done than most. But the idea of he probably wanted fame, like he – ego and fame around that and the people that he let go was was were people that could talk about who he was or a journalist who could write about him people that were outlets and even with the tapes having tapes and having that commodity of what he did felt like it was 
different than most cases. It felt like it was different than most cases. And justice really is not served because the people that victims, families of victims don't get their day in court. They don't Mm -hmm. get to speak their piece. And you don't, you want, of course, want to find out inside the mind of somebody. Was it the same old thing, maybe? But you want to give people at least the ability to like, look, look somebody in the eye in the courtroom and say, hey, and You'd think once you get arrested, what are the chances of this guy t- very easy at getting a handle on a, on a cop's gun? Again, yes. is it negligent? I, I don't know how often that happens, but I think not often enough where they just let this guy go. They've stopped him. Show. And then they he had a shotgun and he's like, what do you do? He's like, all right, mm-hmm. he wins this one and just let him cruise yeah. and not call it in. Go, hey, here's a description. I don't know what happened there, but him getting away with stuff like he, according to him, he's probably earned it up no you know, and yeah. again like the just the ego around it and just the ability of course if you honestly if you get away with enough stuff like with many other cases that we've talked about and read about yeah you think you can get away with more why couldn't you like time has proven that is the case and the fact that he did this first three months is and this these are only the cases that i found we don't know there could be other things out there and the lack of closure for these families the victims of these horrific crimes is really tough you know but ryan o'neill little robert redford those are the standards those were like the ones that were like oh "Oh, yeah pop a cigarette in a guy's mouth damn